Brad, thank you all for coming. And we will be right with the registrar when we're done, which is like, you know, the main thing in my life anyway. So you can do the main thing in your life next time. <laughs> all right, so tonight we're gonna do the last of the technology lectures. And if you were unkind, this is sort of the stuff that's left over from our main discussion, which has been about what do you need to know about the technology of WMD, right, on the theory that WMD is not some romantic idea of the collective unconscious, some archetype mythical thing. It's a physical technology that has limitations. It's made by human beings. It doesn't necessarily work perfectly. You want to have a sense of what the real object is as opposed to the thing that Hollywood keeps talking about. So we've done that. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to pick up on um, a couple of, as I say, things that aren't directly related to what is WMD about. <laughs> the first one, which you have the slide up for right now, is the question about, well, has anything changed, right? Because every once in a while the, I, the, the word gets out that, gee, WMD is awfully hard, and inevitably the response comes back, oh, yeah, 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 that's the old WMD. Things have changed. They said that in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, now we can do it. Forget that old stuff. So we're going to get to the argument, which you will hear enormously if you get into this business again, right? That bioweapons isn't about this old hokey stuff that we talked about last time. It's about biotechnology, right? And the, the world is so awash in either hype or fat, we'll sort that out or try to a little. Uh, the world is so awash in biotech hype, right, that you might be pardoned for thinking that everything really has changed. And to some extent, that's true, right? So we're going to try and unpack that. But you wouldn't have an articulate discussion at all, right, if you didn't know sort of the baseline, what are bioweapons about? And we're going to take that baseline, which is the way you should analyze any new thing, right, and say, well, this is what I knew about the traditional baseline bioweapon WMD. Does this new, how does this new technology change that, right? You don't try and understand the technology as if it's an entirely new subject. You know the subject, and we, we now deal with it analytically, right, and ask, so what's new? So we'll do that, and then we'll go on, and we'll talk about something that, you know, is much less salient, probably a little less important to you from a policy standpoint, but what is the technology of defense, right? We've said almost nothing about the technology of defense in this course. It's all been about how do you make bioweapons. But obviously, right, a large part of what Homeland Security thinks its policy mission is, thinks its development mission is, thinks how it should spend its money is, gee, should we invent new vaccines? Should we invent snazzy new detectors? Uh, are there technological silver bullets that would really change the whole problem? And again, I think what you want to do is you want to have some baseline sense of basic what WMD is, and then you have an array of policy responses. And the problem with dealing with HHS or, I'm sorry, uh, DHS, or really the engineering disciplines on the campus, right, is they're a one-trick pony. They want to think of some technological solution to everything. And hey, I'm an open-minded social science type, really I am, and it's possible, it's happened, that technological change really does provide some silver bullet and now problems are immensely easier than they were before. That's possible. It's not inevitable though, and when you think about should we invest in R&D, well, what I keep urging you to do, right, and by the way, as we get further in the course, we're going to have more back and forth, right? You're going to have to help me with that because we're getting past the part where I need to just impart to you lots and lots of facts. We're getting into open policy questions after, well, certainly after this week. Um, anytime I come to you and say, oh, I want to do this engineering solution and there'll be this silver bullet and that will solve bioweapons as a threat you should sort of come back and say, well, that's half the possible levers. That's very good. Uh, what about civil defense, right? Which is my little hobby horse. I know that, but it's a serious question, right? Should we invent bazillion dollars for some uh, new biological marker to see if you've been infected with something, or would it be better to send pamphlets to people saying don't go out in the street, right? We don't truncate in the real world solutions by technology versus social, right? They're all possible solutions. 
and you don't want to invest in the, them in the wrong order, and so we want to think about the full menu. But today, tonight, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to spend a lot of time, uh, or toward the end of the period, what we're going to do is we're going to spend a lot of time looking at the technological <coughs> side of the fence because you need to know those options, but you need to keep at the back of your mind, right, that these are the things that the engineers are offering us, and almost all of these subjects, right, have been the subject of concerted engineering effort for 100 years, not so true of bio, definitely true of chemical detectors or radiation detectors. There's a long history there. And you have to ask yourself, right, how much more progress are we going to make if DHS makes it quote unquote a priority, right? People have been pushing on these technologies for a long time. You might not have that much additional bang for the buck, no matter how much you want to improve these technologies. They're venerable technologies. People have thought about improving them for a long time. And then you might say, well, you know, I'd love to have this silver bullet, but maybe I, it's impossible. Or maybe it won't happen in my lifetime, or maybe I don't have enough budget for that. And you get back in this idea, right, that it can't, you can't at the outset when you think about these problems say, well, I'm only going to think about technology solutions, or I'm only going to think about social solutions, right? If you're a policy person, your goal is to, do so, is to get the most bang for the buck, the most efficient responses. That means ex ante, you don't kick things off the table. So tonight, we're going to have a little bit of this conceit, right? Most of what we talk about at the end of the uh, period, we're actually going to talk about social stuff a little bit. Most of what we're going to talk about tonight is technological. You need to know the technological options that are on the table. It should be sort of an open question right at this point in the course, you know, whether it's obvious that that's the way home, right? I will tell you in life that, you know, the technology parts of the world have big companies that would produce these artifacts for the government. They have big academic programs in the sciences to develop the inputs to design these things. They have a constituency to solve things in the technological way. But, you know, in this course, we get to think about, well, what's the globally best solution? And it might be that it's a technological solution, but the point of this extended commercial right is that it might also be a social solution, or you might mix them. That, yes, there's some things we can do technologically, but we want to also get people's behavior around the new technologies to change so that that's our optimal solution. We don't want to, you know, economists always believe in diminishing returns, right? If you only invest in technology, you're going to go deeper into diminishing returns. The intuition is you should do a little both most of the time. So that's my commercial, but tonight we'll mostly talk technological. It'll be the last technological lecture. Questions, comments? All right. So I'm not going to do this every time, but I think last time, you know, this whole subject becomes a little bit like the small animal house at the zoo. We talk about the nine things that are hard about chemical weapons, and it feels like the 23 that are hard about biological weapons. And at the end, you want to sort of stand back and take a little stock. And there's no substitute for the facts themselves for the lecture, but I think there's some value in me kind of summarizing because it gives you a hint of my viewpoint, not because my viewpoint is necessarily the correct one, but at least it's a viewpoint. This gives you something to argue with. If you want to think about things slightly differently, fine. You, discarding is free. But you get a little bit of a sense right about the lessons I take away from this subject, and you may take away different ones. Okay. So this is really feels like a long time ago, but at the beginning of the last period, we were still talking about chemical weapons. There was a little bit of that lecture left over. And what we pointed out, right, is that manufacturing is highly non-trivial. The U.S. Army couldn't set up uh, a nerve agent plant, at least until it got its own Nazis, right? Pardon me, um, what did we call them in those days? Paperclip scientists, right? There was a project Paperclip where we grabbed all these people and brought them to the United States before the Russians got them. Um, and, you know, so that tells you something, right? That this is a non-trivial chemical engineering exercise, even if you have presumably unlimited budget. And then the fact that everybody in these plants is always sick all the time, uh, and have really quite substantial fatalities. I mean, show me an industrial operation that kills 1% of the workforce every year. Uh, it's pretty impressive. So, you know, even if you're completely hard-hearted, you get the idea that you're going to have to be hiding sick people from the authorities and that, you know, it may be that all the leaves fall off the trees around your plant. There's a certain cold-blooded security problem in having something that, that's this dangerous. So you have 
highly non-trivial stuff around manufacturing. Of course, the problem with chemical weapons, the theme of this whole WMB discussion really, is that you want to have really, really good poisons, uh, but chemical weapons aren't such good poisons, so even if you're making sarin or something, you need tons and tons of the stuff. So it's not like you, know, you can make this up real cheap in some small installation. You're looking at industrial scale operations and difficult industrial scale operations. You know, there's the budget for the thing, but there's also can you build it at all? Once you have the budget and decide you're gonna try and make it work, can you do it? That's highly non-trivial for chemical weapons, right? And then we talked at the end about, you know, we should start collecting our policy levers for these particular uh, subjects. And for chemical weapons, right, there's the awareness of the general public uh, if you saw some plane flying back and forth across the Bay Area at about 100 feet off the ground, you know, they, one can imagine societies where people would be really paranoid and immediately report that to the police. You can report, you can imagine other societies, ours, where the police would go, huh, that's interesting, and kind of go on about their merry way, right? You could sensitize people to certain kinds of odd behavior. And in Japan, of course, you have Aum Shinrikyo with like, trucks going down the street with some plume of aerosol coming out of the top of the truck. And this is highly suspicious behavior, but it's odd, right? Unless you know this chemical weapon story, you're not really worried about it. You say, huh, that's odd. But you're not sensitized to go, uh-oh, we're in trouble. We have to, you know, if you wanted a more paranoid society or a society that would detect that stuff, well, you could publicize it. And in Japan, obviously, that's what happened. Right? that people be, got to where they recognized these strange behaviors just because it became relevant in their lives. And then there are other things you could do. You could educate doctors. So this acute clinician, I mean, astute clinician idea, the, the guy who actually recognizes the symptoms when they present themselves, that's a function of how often doctors are told this stuff. Uh, symptoms of nerve agent are very distinctive. The only other thing they look like is pesticide poisoning, and there's some background of that in the society, so it's not unfamiliar. Detectors we'll talk about tonight, gas masks, and remediation we'll talk about tonight, too. So that's chemical. Radiological I just like because here's a form of WMB that we never actually built, right? If you, you're into this sort of technological in, uh, inevitability of science, this is a counterexample. We didn't build these, we started to in the early 50s, but we never built these as a real military weapon. Uh, what we have instead is this RDD threat that people talk about, the dirty bombs that you get in detective novels and in the movies. Um, and, you know, it's about moving around a very small number of curies. And if you succeed in spreading those curies over a large area, right, the dose that people pick up from walking around in that environment is very, very small. And then you have a problem, right? It's not an unusual problem in public policy, but you know almost nothing about the effects at that level, right? It's possible it's making people healthier, right? That's consistent with the data. It's not a risk you'd particularly take, right? But it's a way of dramatizing that you really, really, really know nothing. Um, about the likely health effects, and yet you must decide, right? So that's not unfamiliar in public policy, but it is this, the odd part about RDDs. It's the thing nobody can quite get their minds around, and the hard cases at the national labs, that's why they call uh, RDDs radiological dispersal, dispersal devices, weapons of mass disruption, right? It's a, it's a knock, right? Oh, that's not a real weapon. This, this is a real weapon, they say at the labs, right? They're quite underwhelmed by RDDs, but still they have to deal with it. And then finally, we won't do much in this course, but it's sort of an inevitable argument that comes up in all this. Even if you can't make an RDD yourself, could you intentionally replicate something like what happened in Japan? And you know, you can go, if you have an interest in this, there are people who've written articles and books about that possibility. It's not entirely clear, right? Particularly if you're an outsider, doesn't know how the plants are configured, that might actually be problematical. But still, there's a lot more curies locked up in a nuclear power plant than you're ever going to get by, you know, patiently scraping the americium off uh, 1,000 smoke detectors. That's just not a game that you're going to get very far with. So that's what we said about radiological, and then we spent most of the time last last time 
talking about biological, and the come on is that because biology, because uh, agents, right, organisms replicate inside the human body, very small numbers of agents, usually not one, but maybe 50, um, reproduce. And so you don't have to have a big factory making the stuff. Uh, you use your victims for that. And that's the come on, right? That it's the ultimate poison. Well, it's not quite the ultimate poison. We'll talk about better ones tonight. But it's the idea that, right, uh, if you can make any one of these poison-based things work, biological is the most appealing. It's also, conversely, the most difficult, uh, both to design the thing and, and then to actually build it and, and, and spread it in the environment. And we listed these steps before, nothing, you know, I'm not gonna go over them in detail, but you have to select an agent that you wanna use. You guess you would usually do ones that state programs have done before because states have often tried to weaponize things and failed. It's really comforting to know that somebody made the thing work before. Then you have to get a copy of the organism. Then you have to improve the organism, unless you have a copy of the state organism, right? That's what this Bruce Ivins guy had. He just took the army's anthrax. Boy, that's great if you can get it. Uh, but if you don't have that, then you have to find one that's just as virulent, and then you have to breed in all these properties so it can live out in the environment. Uh, and then you have to do this black art, right, where you figure out how to put it in some liquid and slurry environment so that it isn't immediately killed when it's sprayed out in the air. Uh, and so it survives getting forced through the aerosol nozzle. And more than that, if you want to have the really you know, effective WMV, the stuff that all the militaries aspire to, the stuff that's supposedly hydrogen bomb scale uh, casualties, then you have to figure out a way to dry it and you know, have a freeze-dried powder that you can spread from an airplane. Then you have to make the stuff. Um, that's actually sort of well, it's certainly not trivial, it takes know-how, but, but it's actually a much less capital-intensive exercise because you're not making tons of the stuff, right? This is where you get back the advantage of uh, having this really, really strong poison, and you have to figure out a way to deliver it. And what's worth noting, right, is that on Shinrikyo, with all its really, you know, unlimited budget, and they did, after all, have various biologists on staff, managed to make these things quite difficult. Um, and I should mention one thing, which I guess I forgot last time. Uh, the thing you, well, I mean, one, one thing that I mentioned, right, is that the thing that's a little disturbing about biological is once you've done it, then anybody who's seen the trick, who knows the recipe, can do it the second time, and you have these low capital barriers, right? It's not uh, a big complicated thing the second time. So that's disturbing, right? The, once you have one of these attacks, you expect more. The world changes in a way that it doesn't change if you're building tons of chemical weapons and you expend them all and now you have to start assembling tons again. Um, but there's something I should have mentioned and I will mention now, which is that when I say that you have to have the information in biology, that usually means that you actually have to have the physical cell line. So once you've bred this thing, it's true you can make more copies of it, but that means that you have the cell line. It's not like you can, you know, if you tell the story, well, gee, you know, you go out on the internet and get this information. That's not true in biology. You also need whatever organisms are referenced in the, um, in the internet reference. And to that extent, right, it's always about materials in biology. Uh, query, one thing we'll talk about tonight is this new subject that's very hot at Cal called synthetic biology, where you can make DNA out of sugar cane or oil. Uh, does that change this, right? Now you don't have to have uh, an actual sample of the weapon that was bred last time. You just need its genome, right? You download the genome, paste it, put it in a document, send it off, and they send you back the DNA. Does that change things? So that's what we did last time. Oh dear, there's more. And we talked about various policy levers. I'm not going to say much about them. Uh, but the point again is that there are you know, various things that you can do, and, and we talked about them, but you can do non-proliferation, you can try and control these technologies so that people don't get them. If you worry about synthetic DNA, you can try and get the companies to look at who they sell to. You can do deterrence if you think at least that there are state actors involved. That, that means 
coming up with forensics, ways to figure out credibly if you're attacked, whose technology you were attacked with. Vaccinations are obvious. Um, you can train for how you do responses, and in particular, you can stockpile drugs so that if there is a major attack, there are drugs in the neighborhood that you can give to people. Gas masks and regular facial masks actually are really unreasonably effective at preventing inhalation. Surveillance, we'll talk about detectors tonight, astute clinicians again, and education and civil defense. But the point is that you again have, you know, a dozen broad policy options. And God knows we're not going to solve that in this course, but you should be aware, right, that somebody brings you some silver bullet technology solution. Well, that's nice, but there are competitors. And before you plumped everything in, you know, whatever the solution du jour is, you'd want to persuade yourself, right, that you're not, that there isn't something simpler that you're leaving off the table. There are a lot of options here that you would push on. And your intuition would be that you'd end up with something fairly balanced, right, that you try several things because you expect that any policy intervention is going to have diminishing returns. All right, so that's prelude. Uh, so we'll round out uh, the biological weapons, the WMD section, uh, by talking about uh, whether anything has changed. We live in this biotech century, they keep telling us. Has that made us more vulnerable? And then we'll go on to sort of defense technologies. So I just said this, the bioweapons are hard. And is there anything that changes, right? Is there some loophole? Everything we know about bioweapons is involving state programs. But maybe it's easier for terrorists, or maybe the technology has changed since the Russians, for instance, did some preliminary stuff with biotech. Maybe you could do a lot more today. That's certainly a reasonable thing to believe. Uh, so the point with uh, contagious weapons, right, is that militaries don't like them, but maybe terrorists do. Uh, because they don't worry about the same things that militaries do. Chiefly, they don't worry about the idea, or maybe they don't worry about the idea that you start some epidemic, it'll eventually come back and infect your people too. And we'll talk about biotech, so you know, how does genetic engineering change things? And then a couple of new technologies that have been advanced, right, is something that fundamentally changes uh, the bioweapons problem. And that's, that's the agenda for this section of the evening. All right, so basically two categories here. Talk about contagious diseases, and then we'll go on to uh, bioweapons. I'm sorry, on to genetic engineering. And the point is that if you, you know, the old world, the, the thing we know about, what were they building biological weapons for? They were building them for... Uh, military use, and in particular, you know, military stress, so-called combined arms, the idea that you want the air wing to work with the armor, to work with the infantry, that all these weapons should fit together, and, you know, at 12.15 you bomb them with this, and at 12.30 these guys start moving, and everything should work predictably, predictably together on schedule robustly, because you don't want, like, you know, your attack at 12.15 is completely nothing, and then you do something at 12.30, obviously that you know, you're going to have sort of failure propagate through your, your plan if, if that's what happens. So you would like these to be very robust weapons, but bioweapons are always finicky, right? Oh, we should have an inversion and there shouldn't be any sunlight. And you know, there are lots of, of uh, constraints and, and the whole history of the business is to make them predictable enough that you could use them with other military weapons. So, I get, you know, so, I, so the point is that for terrorist weapons, you could argue, right, that, well, the terrorists can try this, and if nothing happens, there isn't any second thing they're going to do anyway. It's not a complicated plan in that way. Just go ahead and try the attack, and if nothing much happens, you don't get noticed. Well, no harm, no foul. That's sort of the argument that you could make do with less reliable weapons, that you don't have to have these endless animal testing to make sure that you can actually deliver it, that it has predictable consequences, um, et cetera. Um, and we know already on this argument that contagious weapons will get back to you that the Soviets already took this risk, right? That they did have a smallpox program. Uh, they just thought that it wouldn't come back from North America ever. And if the Soviets believed that, at least plausibly, one can believe that, that uh, terrorists would believe that. 
And if you believe that, right, there's smallpox, and then there are much less effective agents. Plague is certainly infectious, but much, much less infectious than smallpox. It's not clear, you'll see the references in the book, that hemorrhagic fevers can be weaponized at all. Nobody's ever done it. Um, so it's sort of, the contagious world is pretty much smallpox. And then the question is, so do I believe this story? So suppose that the terrorists really didn't worry that smallpox would jump back over the Atlantic to, to get at them. And suppose they didn't really worry about uh, a reliable weapon in that sense, but they were willing to take a shot at it. Is this something that they would find worth investing in? And the question is, right, that nobody's done this experiment since Yugoslavia in the 1970s. We really don't know how smallpox propagates in modern societies. And so there's a blank space on the map. What we do know is that in the 1970s, there were still a lot of people walking around who had had uh, immunizations. And almost nobody, right, except people who've been in the military now, uh, are, immune to, are immune to smallpox now. So you would expect that if there's a smallpox epidemic, right, we're a much more mobile society than we used to be. And we have much less the charming epidemiological phrase, herd immunity, than we used to. So maybe this would come ravaging through the population. Uh, and then the question is, if you're evaluating this risk, so how good do you think the models are, what, and what do the models say? And then the other question is, right, that um, most of the plagues that you hear about, the smallpox plagues, like you know, with the American Indians, well, these people didn't have public health departments. To what extent does public health departments, whose job, after all, is to keep things from propagating through the uh, civilian population, to what extent do they make the, prob the probability of, of some big um, artificial contagion uh, manageable or, or not worth the candle? So as I say, everything we know about this, and you know, we have sort of a, in the chapter, you can read sort of an extended summary of the evidence. It's a little alarming, right? So what happens is you start out with these very simple models where uh, what happens is that one person gets infected and he infects N of his friends. You, you tell me what number you want, three of his friends. So at every moment in time, the number of people who are getting infected right now is proportional to the number of people who are already infected, right? Because each of them is infecting three of his friends. What kinds of models, who's the math head around here, right? What kinds of models are those? Growth is proportional. The rate of growth is proportional to the number of people already infected. What kind of model is that? So the rate of growth is the slope of a function, right? So what I'm saying is that the height of the function, the number of people infected, the slope of that function is the growth. The, the slope is always proportional to the absolute value of the function. What's that the definition of? I know there's a math head here. You're just trying not to embarrass me. So this is the formula for exponential growth. Right? If you make a simple story like this, the number of people who get infected in each generation is the number of people who are already infected. And this is why they call it exponential, right? If you have a few people, the growth is kind of small. But once you have a lot of people, the growth is enormous. So it gets very, very steep. And in a simple model, right, how does it end? Everybody in the society is infected. Well, there are no diseases like that historically, right? This captures part of the, the subject. It's the traditional way people have written epidemiology models since the 1920s. Um, there are phases in real world epi epidemics which are approximately exponential. But there's a sense in which this is a toy model, too, and you don't really quite believe it. And in particular, you know, what's odd about that simple model? Well, the simple model says that each of us infects three more. And you know, that's true for Sahar, because three people will talk to her, but nobody's going to talk to me, right? So if you don't have that detailed knowledge about social relations, you're glossing over something, right? And this is what happens when you build models. You build models to simplify things that are, have lots of complicated factors, but you think one thing is the dominant effect. 
So you might write a simple model that ignores the fact that Sahar has more friends than I do. You might do that. But that's always a social science modeling choice, right? That, that it might be the most important fact is that Sahar has more friends than I do. And if that were true, right, then this would be a crummy model. It would be mathematically correct. It would make beautiful graphs. It might make publishable papers. But there's always, when you have models, right, a choice, an aesthetic choice, if you will, or at least one that you match against the world. Am I picking the right salient feature to construct the whole model? And in particular, why might you believe, right, that even if all of us have exactly the same number of friends, and this is clearly untrue, right, why would you believe that, you know, we would have the same spreading rate throughout the uh, infection? Is that reasonable? I mean, what happens when there are, till the 20th century, right, the, they're basically through 1918, we have these regular mass epidemics in the West. We live in this odd world, right, where none of our parents remember pandemics. But all of Western history, right, is about one pandemic after another uh, until 1918 influenza, which is so far the last of those. But you notice how nervous people get about bird flu, right? It's all very shaky. What happens when you get deep into one of these things? By the way, you want summer reading on biological weapons? I tell you the shrewdest thing you can read about how people behave, what actually happens, what doesn't happen. Defoe's Journal of the Plague here, which is a fraud, it pretends to be by an eyewitness. It's incredibly shrewd, and almost everything in the biological weapons literature is right there, and Defoe is very entertaining. So he talks about walking around London. He wasn't born yet, but walking around London and how the people behaved and how the rumors spread and and uh, whether there's mass panic or people behave in an orderly way, it's very, very shrewd stuff. So maybe this shows that there's nothing new, or maybe this shows that just great value in having your nose right up against the data. When you have plagues like this every couple of decades, you get very, very shrewd in this way that we are, by comparison, innocents, right? But in any case, what happens late in, the, in, these, in, these, in these plagues, right? Do people continue to have exactly three friends? Come on. You can guess one of two things. They become very promiscuous, right? They suddenly have six friends. No, that's not going to happen. Right? Or they kind of quit interacting. And one of the things you see about, you know, memoirs of the 1918 influenza, right, is that sort of people become feeling very isolated because nobody wants to get near anybody else. You don't know who's sick. And you can change this, right? So certainly, when, you're, when you have a substantial epidemic, not only do you have this common sense isn't quite the right phrase because people often do stupid things based on quote unquote common sense, but they become very receptive to listening to public health messages. So, you know, everywhere in America, right, you have these rules about spitting on the sidewalk. Well, where does that come from? It comes from the 1918 influenza plague and hasn't really been enforced ever since, except when the cops want to lean on you, right? Uh, this expression, you know, next time you spit on the sidewalk, I'll be there and throw you in jail. I always say this in the cop movies. There are such laws in most places. Uh, it's about changing behavior, right? You can deliberately change behavior, and in the middle of one of these epidemics, a lot of people will listen to you. So you can talk about changing your practices and, you know, everybody walks around with masks or whatever. This is a social construct. There are social content to how these models work. And it isn't just that, you know, we always have exactly three friends. Even those of us who have three friends might change our mind as this goes on. Or it might be amenable, right, to something like a public policy letter. So in the nature of things, you know, in real life, some people have 18 friends and some people have none. And that's complicated and there are chains of people that, you know, if you can get to one of these people early who has 18 friends, the, the whole prospects of the epidemic are much bigger than if you happen to come at an unlucky place in the chain and, you know, it peters out. Um, so, you know, the models are very complex to begin with and they're not written in stone. That, that, you can intervene, at least to a large extent, by teaching people new behaviors. Um, so the upshot is 
when you look at the history of the smallpox models, and as I say, if smallpox isn't a problem, none of the other biological weapons is going to be. It's just so much more effective than the others as a contagious disease. If you look at the smallpox models, what happens is they start off with these exponential models, and then year after year, right, the expected number of fatalities goes down and down and down based on quote-unquote more realistic models. But there's kind of a problem there, right, because you can make a realistic model of measles because, well, maybe not anymore, but because we have fairly recent real measles epidemics. And what happens in real life, right, is we don't build a model from the ground up saying that Sahar has three friends and you have six friends and I have no friends and, you know, and build chains that, that are measured from the world. We don't do that. What we actually do is we build models that are fit to historical measles epidemics. And that's great if you're, if you're modeling measles or something that's not too far removed from measles. We don't have the ability to do this so-called semi-empirical fit to smallpox. So even though we have models that do a pretty good job at measuring the flu season, okay, okay, you watch this every year, you think it's like the weather, maybe we don't have models that are all that good, but we have really lousy models for smallpox because we can't do semi-empirical fits to anything, you know, when there were internal combustion engines around. You're, you know, the closest analogs are from societies that are completely different in terms of how often people interact and how fast this stuff spreads. You're really stepping off into the dark. So that's an interesting problem for both us and for the terrorists, right? What do we think would happen? The last smallpox uh, outbreaks in Western history, right, have been pretty underwhelming. The Yugoslavs did a good job, although they were very, very insistent, right? They closed the borders and put rings around villages that were infected and, you know, were very, very, if you worry about civil liberties, right, it's a little troubling. Um, but they stamped the thing out in a hurry. Not too many people died. The story's in the book. Uh, New York City in the 40s, not much older than that, right? Did a wonderful job of suppressing uh, smallpox. But in those societies, right, most people had had the inoculation. So it's just different for us. And, you know, what do we know? And we have people who certainly know more about it than I do, but I think it's quite clear, right, that this is what makes horse races.